run towards gunfire and firemen run into burning buildings and these medical professionals are running towards a virus, running towards infection. And when you think about that, that's incredible because it's not only they have this burden for those who are sick that they want to see them through, but they are putting their own lives at risk by taking care of them and the lives of their loved ones at risk. And it's absolutely incredible. I just want to take the time to pray for them, thank them, and just uh, wish them the best as they take care of us. Let's, let's pray. Lord, we do praise you for all the medical professionals out there who are on the front lines of this whole pandemic. And Lord, we just ask that you would especially be with them, that you would continue to bolster their courage and faith, and you would give them strength, and you would see them through. And Lord, help them to feel appreciated. Help them to feel loved. And Lord, help them to realize that they're making a huge difference. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Today, we're going to launch into a whole new series. We're going to be in James, and we're going to be exploring the book together. James is an incredibly practical book. And today, he's going to talk to us about trials and ordeals and storms and just the hard stuff of life. When I was in high school, I went to a strange high school. It may seem strange to a lot of people by today's standards. We had class six days a week. So I went to school on Saturday, believe it or not, and it was a full class load on Saturday, and we as whiny teenagers would complain about it, right? We would complain about the workload, and our headmaster would hear us whining and complaining, and eventually he would say something along these lines. He would say, this is actually good. It will build character. Now, he said it in a way that didn't kind of irritate. He had this love about him and this compassion about him that it came off well. But he would say it over and over again. At that same school, we had to do a sport every season. Everybody had to play a sport every season. We were a small school. It was the only way we were going to compete. But also, they knew there were things on the ball field that you weren't going to learn anywhere else. You weren't going to get it in the classroom. You needed to be on an athletic team. So guess what us whiny teenagers would do? We would complain about it because not only do we have to go to school on Saturday, but now we had to practice every day of the week, and we had to go to games and the workload. And so guess what? We would complain to the headmaster, and he would say something like this. It builds character. Now, if that's not bad enough, that's not bad enough. We were also the workers of the school. The, the students did the work of the school. I don't know why we paid to go there. We were the janitors. We were the busboys. We were the dishwashers. We were the groundskeepers, and we had chores every day. So guess what we did? We complained about having school on Saturday. We complained about having to play a sport, and then we complained about having to do all the work of the school and we'd go to Dr. Bartlett, and we would cry about it and moan about it and complain about it. And guess what he would say? It builds character. And if that's not bad enough, I, I'm telling you, it was hard growing up when I was a kid, right? Uphill, both ways in the snow. Um, we also had chapel every single day. Every day we'd have to go to chapel, and it was the most boring experience of your life. It was terrible. And so guess what teenagers would do? We would whine and complain about it, and Dr. Bartley would say, hey, it's okay. It builds character. He was of this mindset that he wanted to put things on us rather than take things off of us. And that seems strange in a culture of convenience and shortcuts. I know that seems crazy. But believe it or not, God kind of thinks the same way as Dr. Bartlett, he believes that trials and hardships can actually be leveraged and used for our growth and help us to become mature and complete and not lacking anything. And that's what we're in today. We're going to explore this path that God has for us and how God kind of lays out hardships and struggles and trials along that path intentionally for us because he actually does love us. And he sees that we have this incredible potential and he wants to bring it out of us. He wants us to move into this fullness of life that he has for us. He sees what we can become, and he knows how to bring it out, but sometimes we resist. So if you have your Bibles, we're in James, James chapter 1. We're going to pick it up in verse 1, and this is uh, what God's Word says. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. This is James. So 
Who's James? James is not the disciple James that was with Jesus in his ministry. This is James, the brother of Jesus. Well, half-brother of Jesus. Did you know Jesus had brothers and sisters? In fact, there are four brothers that are actually named in Scripture, and they were not fans of Jesus. In fact, one time they come to take Jesus away, and they want to commit him. They think he's lost his mind. And so they were a bit skeptical and cynical and kind of pushed back against Jesus' ministry. But after Jesus died and was raised again, Paul tells us that Jesus made a special visit to his brother James. And it totally changed his life. And James became a believer. More than that, James became a chaser. He, he chased after what God has for him. He saw how his brother lived, and he saw the difference it made in his life. And James had that example, and James became this hard charger. He became someone who chased his potential, and James grew mightily, incredible. He, he had nicknames like this. This is what they called him. These were his nicknames. Imagine having this, James the Just. Or how do you like this? James the Righteous. The one I love best is they called him Old Camel Knees. And that's because he spent so much time in prayer, he developed calluses on his knees like a camel. This guy became an incredible leader of the church. He, he became a world changer. God did an incredible work in his life. And James knows what it takes to grow. He knows how it takes place. And he writes this book to us to help us chase our potential, have, help us lay hold of what God has for us. And that's what this is all about. James, a servant, so he's got that humility of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes. And I don't believe he means literal 12 tribes. I think he means spiritual 12 tribes, all believers that are scattered throughout the nations, he says, greetings. And then he starts it out in this famous way. He says this, he says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, Whenever you face trials of many kinds, consider it joy. Now, this is not joy like you might be thinking right now. It's not like, woohoo, I get to have a root canal. It's not that kind of joy. And it's not like, oh, come over to the house. My wife and I would love. We're having this party, the celebration, because I got diagnosed with cancer. He's not talking some absurd kind of joy thing here. This is considered joy. This is a thoughtful joy. This is, this is one of those things that recognizes you're in an ordeal, you're in a trial, and it is not fun. But it's this thoughtfulness that says, you know, even though I have to go through this trial, God is going to use it. There's an upside to this. There's a silver lining on this dark cloud. Consider it a pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of all these various kinds, and there's little things and there's big things, right? And we all get bunches. He says, the reason you should have joy now is because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. The testing of your faith, that's the word that's like a refiner's fire. It is like how, how you refine gold or silver. God is taking your faith, that, 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 that gamish of the things called faith, and he's refining it, and he's removing dross, and he's removing impurities, and he's, he's making it more and more precious, and more and more pure, and more and more vital. That's one word, but it also says, testing of your faith produces what? Perseverance, and that's steadfastness, the idea of under a load, carrying a load, with a load on your back, and being borne down by it, and weighted down by it. And that is like going to the gym. So it's not just faith that's refined. It's faith like a muscle that's being strengthened so that you're becoming this behemoth, strong, spiritual figure that can change the world. He's saying, hey, even though that trial is horrible, this pandemic is not fun, God wants to use it to refine our faith and develop perseverance. But notice what he says next, because this is the key. He says, let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete not lacking anything he says let perseverance finish its work what does that mean that means our growth depends on us that if we're going to get anything out of that trial we've got to let it happen meaning we can get in the way we can 
We can shortchange this thing that God is trying to do. God has this incredible thing he's trying to move us for, but we don't want to go through the ordeal. And sometimes we don't let perseverance finish its work. Why should we? Because it's the way that God has given us for us to become mature and complete and not lacking anything. That's your potential. Mature is, is the idea of growing into what you can be. It's about skills and talents and honing those and getting better and better and taking what God's given you and making the most out of it, maturing it. And completeness is different. Mature and complete. Complete means you're lacking something and God's going to add to it that wasn't there already. So God gives us things that we didn't have before. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all the fruits of the Spirit, right? God wants to put those things in as well. So we can become mature and complete. And the summation is, and we're not lacking anything. We become who we can be in Christ. We have that fullness, that potential that he has for us. We become who we can be. And James wants that for every single one of us. And that's why in this letter, that's his primary focus. This is his big deal. But guess what? We as believers can get in the road and not let perseverance finish its work. How? How, how does that work? God has set out things intentionally for us. And the natural tendency of our human natures is to bail, to just get out of it, that shortcut, that compromise. And we miss out on what that trial was intended to do. Let me give you a few examples. So, for instance, God has called us to do something incredibly challenging and hard, and it's called tithing. God wants us to grow into more than that. He wants us to be generous like he is, gracious. Well, tithing is like kind of like the test lab. It's the training wheels. It's how we start. And God says, I want you to give the first 10% to me. Well, that's hard to do. That's an incredible challenge. That takes serious faith. And it's because of it, most Christians never tithe. Most Christians just bail on it. They don't persevere. They don't let perseverance finish its work. And so what they give up is they give up all these skills they get to develop about finances. They give up all the faith training that comes with living on less than they could. They give up also on all this generosity and seeing the difference it makes. And they give up on the faith of seeing God provide each month. And so what happens is they take them out of that learning laboratory, that learning situation and they bail on it and they never learn the things that other believers learn in that area that's just one think about it. it all of these trials god has given us personal devotions god says hey i want you to devote yourself to prayer in colossians in james we're going to find out later that he wants us to deeply look into his word and continue to get a habit of it he wants us to be studiers of the word well, that takes effort. That's a trial. That's a burden. And a lot of believers, they bail. They don't do it. They're not willing to bear the price. They're not willing to sit under that pressure and steadfastly carry that load and develop the muscles that come from that and the skills, but also the hugeness of having that connection with God for when the trials really get rough. But they also miss out on learning to commune with God and developing it to the point where it's, hey, praying continuously, being in constant contact. But they also don't know the word then. They don't have it on their hearts and they don't have it in their minds and it hasn't refreshed and renewed and they don't think the way they should. And so when trials come, they make way more mistakes. Think about it. There's all these kinds of trials. There's worship. Do you worship? There's small groups. Are you in community serving? We're supposed to be out there making a difference. Man, that's hard to do. It's hard to make yourself go out there and minister to people and make a difference in the world. And so a lot of believers fail. And they miss out on developing those skills and talents and making a difference in the world. He says, hey, listen, God's given you this path, the path that leads to your future and your potential. And all along the way, he's put these steps, these trials. And if you'll... Let perseverance finish its work. If you will persevere in the trials that he's given you, he will use them to grow you till you're mature and complete and not lacking anything. 
Well, that leads to a huge question, and he's going to answer it without even asking it. How do we do that? How do, we, how do I do a devotion? Or how do I parent? God, you're sending a child my way. How am I supposed to parent this child and really train them up in the ways of the Lord? Or how do I be a wife? How do I be a husband? How, how do I do a budget? How do I do these things? James knows that with trials comes a need for information, know-how. And so that leads to the next thing. He says, if any of you lacks wisdom, this, wisdom is just spiritual know-how. It's how to parent. It's how to be a wife. It's how to be a husband. It's how to tithe and do your finances. It's how to do devotions. It's wisdom. How do I get along with that boss that's driving me nuts? If any of you lacks wisdom in this trial, and you don't want to bail, you don't want to compromise, you want to stay in this thing, but you want to do it right, you want to do it best, you want to get as much out of this as possible, that's wisdom. And if you lack it, if you need it, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Don't Google it. We'll go to Google later. But the first thing is ask God because it's God's wisdom. In James, James has two kinds of wisdom. He has the world's wisdom, which is bad. And then he has the wisdom that's from above, heavenly wisdom, which is the good wisdom. It's the right way to live. If any of you lacks that right way to live, Google's not necessarily going to give it to you, but God will. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Why? Because he gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Who gives generously. It's actually the word for single-mindedly. Meaning, what God really wants What he's passionate about is you and your success, your thriving, your potential, your future. God wants you to succeed. It would be cruel of God to say, hey, I want you to live under this trial, but I'm not going to give you the wisdom for how to do it. I'm not going to show you how to do it. That would be crazy. God single-mindedly wants to make sure you have everything you need, all the know-how you possibly could need to be the parent, to be a husband to do devotions, to get along with that boss, to handle your finances, all of it. He, he's single mind. He's generously going to give to you everything you need without finding fault. Meaning he's not going to badmouth you about your past and blowing it before. It, it's do you want it now? And if you want it now, I'm going to give it to you without bringing that stuff up. And it will be given to you. So this is one of the things he wants you to know is that as far as his character, as far as his nature is concerned, if you ask for wisdom, sincerely ask for wisdom, he will, he promises he'll give it to you. He promises you you will have it. But then he gives us this little bit. He says, but when you ask, when you ask, You must believe. That's that faith thing, that whole journey of faith thing that we're on with him. You must believe and not doubt. Doubt gets really confusing. Please don't misunderstand doubt. The word doubt actually means debate. You're having a a discussion in your head, and you have like two sides, and you're actually debating with yourself. I could do this, or I could do that, and you can't make up your mind. There's no resolution. You're actually split. It's spiritual schizophrenia. He says, but You must believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave on the sea blown and tossed by the wind. And I picture a bobber or a cork out there in the ocean and the waves are going up and down and the wind blowing it back and forth. It's totally unstable. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Double-minded is really, if you want to think about it, double-souled. You're split. You're double-souled. What's going on there? What is he talking about? Because I want wisdom, and, and if I don't believe perfectly, there's a lot of misunderstanding about belief and doubt. This is, again, belief in God's character that God wants to give wisdom, and his wisdom is good. That's what we have to believe, that God will give it, and it's good when I get it. I should do it. A doubter is going to be this way. I don't know if God's going to give that to me. And if he gives it to me, I don't know if it's really what I want to do. 
And so a doubter is more of a curiosity seeker. They're going to God for wisdom. You know, I, I kind of like to know what God says about this guy or about this girl or about this thing. I'm kind of curious. I want to know, but I'm not locked in on doing it. I want to hear it first. And if I like it, if it's better than this, I'll do it. That's doubting. That is the definition of doubting. Because you really don't believe what God's going to show you is best and it's good. That's doubt. And you think something else is going to be better. Meaning, you don't trust the character of God. You don't really believe that what God has for you is best and that he wants best for you, that he loves you and cares for you. That kind of doubt is terrible. Why? Because it's an insult. It insults God. And that person should not think you're going to get anything from God. They're double-minded and they're unstable in all they do. They can't make up their mind. So what belief is, is I know that if I ask God, he's going to give it to me. And whatever he gives me, that's what I'm going to do. And so once you pray that prayer, then you Google. Then you talk to your pastor. Then you talk to your Christian friends and you hunt down wisdom. God's promised you, you will get it. But you have to knock for the door to be open. You have to seek in order to find, right? And so you have to do the legwork. How do I parent? Well, ask God for it, really believe, and then talk to some parents and study the Bible about parenting. God will give it to you. And when you get that answer, when it clicks, run with it. Whatever it is, whatever God shows you, run with it. That's the way of life. That's wisdom. So he says, hey, you want your future. You want this potential. It comes on this path full of trials. And you want to persevere in those trials so you can be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And along the way, God will give you wisdom so you can navigate those trials the way he wants you to. And then he gives us examples. He's, he shows us what they look like. In verse, uh, verse 9, he talks about poor people first. That this is their trial. Poverty, right, can be a trial. It's one of those stresses that some people have in life where they have to live with little means. Their trial, their temptation is to think of themselves as defeated before they ever begin. They can, they can expect this constant no. Poor people hear no, no, no. They begin to say no to themselves, and they don't even ask anymore. And they, they basically cop out on life, and they just give up. And God says, no, 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 don't, don't go that way in the trial. He says, believers in humble circumstances need wisdom. And what is it? They ought to take pride in their high position. Yes, the Bible says you should take pride in certain things. And one of the things that we're told that poor people at least should do is take pride in their position, their spiritual position, that they aren't poor. They're rich in Christ. God has blessed them with every heavenly gift. They are heirs with Christ. They are brothers and sisters of Jesus, meaning they're prince and princesses. They are children of the kingdom. They, they have incredible standing, and they can expect yeses because of who they are in Christ. And so God doesn't want them to live defeated lives. He wants them to live lives that go out there, make a difference, do things, try this for God, rather than feeling defeated. So huge wisdom. But the next one he gives us is for the rich. But the rich should take pride, yeah, them too, but in their humiliation. Why? Because the trial, believe it or not, the Bible's saying, James is saying, riches are a trial. Now, it's a trial many of us would love to have, but the Bible says that the actual temptation there, the, the catch, the trap there, is pride. That rich people can actually start thinking they're superior, that they're better, that they're wiser, that they get it and other people don't. And if other people would just shape up, they could have it too. And they, they give themselves all the credit for their wealth, and they just put themselves above everybody else. And that's a terrible place to be because pride comes before the fall. 
But the rich should take pride, what? In their humiliation. What humiliation? Since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. It blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. So James says, hey, rich people, don't get uppity. In fact, remind yourself that everything you have in this world, this, this life of prosperity and blessing is a glimpse. It's a vapor. It's just a wildflower that's here today and gone tomorrow. The sun will come and the scorching wind will come and that wither will fly, fall off, wither and fall to the ground and it'll be just a fleeting thing. It'll happen while they go about their business. It'll happen without you even being aware that it's happening. He's saying everything that God brings on us can be a trial in a sense. And we need wisdom for that. Because God wants to use that to grow us. And that's how he gets to the last verse. He says blessed, which is the idea of fortunate. This is, it goes back to that happy thing, that joy thing. Hey, you don't realize it, but you can consider this joy. You can, you can realize you're blessed in this, that you are truly fortunate. Blessed is the one who perseveres, who doesn't bail, who doesn't compromise, that carries that load and presses on. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, having weathered that storm, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised for those who love him. Why love him? He's talking about perseverance and trials. Jesus told us this incredible truth. He says, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Basically, what Jesus teaches is that if we're really going to obey, do his will, do that wisdom thing, if we're really going to persevere under that trial rather than escape and disobey, we're going to have to love him. We're going to love him and want to please him. We're going to want to live life in a way that honors him. That all flows from love, not fear. And so if you're going to persevere, if you're going to seek wisdom and run after what God has for you, and you're going to live underneath that trial, it takes love for God. But if you do, he promises this, that person will receive the crown of life. Now, don't be picturing some gold crown. That's, that's not what this is. It's not jeweled and bedazzled or any of those kind of things. This is the kind of crown they got at the Olympic Games. It's the laurel crown. When somebody would run a race and win, they would go to the podium and they would get this laurel leaf crown. It was green <laughs> with leaves on it. And that was their victory crown. What he's saying is this, and it's similar to what Paul says. Paul says, hey, get out there. Run your race and run your race so as to win the prize. James is saying something similar. Everybody has their race to run. Everybody has their path to go down. And everybody has their set of trials in order to become who they can be. And James is saying, hey, go get yours. Persevere. Have joy in it and, and become who you can be. Chase this fullness. Chase your potential. Run your race because at the end of the race, if you are faithful, all of us, not just you, we can all receive a crown. Yes, everybody gets a trophy. Everybody gets a crown because everybody can run their race that God has given them, and it's the crown of life because that's what's on the other side. Jesus said this, I've come that you may have life and have it to the full. That's the promise we have a hard time believing, that God's gift, his promise, this thing down the road is actually full. It's this fuller life. It's this more meaningful, more complete life. It has more joy. It has more peace. It has more love. It has more fulfillment in every way. It's full. It is the crown of life. Let's pray. Lord, we do praise you. We do thank you that uh, you believe in us and you believe in our future. 
And you believe in our potential, and we just praise you for that. Lord, I just ask that you would help us to see trials as a means to that end, that they're, they're strewn along the path of life, and they're stepping stones. They're not things to be avoided. They're things to be persevered through. And Lord, help us do that. Help us, help us to persevere in the trial we're under right now, whatever that might be. And Lord, help us to consider it a joy because you're up to something good in that. You're growing us into that fullness and that greater life. Wherever you are, I'm going to put some uh, prayer ideas on the screen. And I, I want you to think about these. And I'm going to give you a couple minutes to pray through these things on your own. And pray with your family. Take just a couple minutes. And then I'll come and close this out in prayer. And pray these four things or whatever else God leads you to. Take time to pray. Lord, one of the things we really need to do right now is just say, forgive us. Lord, there's some things that you brought our way that uh, scared us. They intimidated us. And we took shortcuts and we just bailed. We didn't do what you asked us to do and we're still not doing it. And Lord, we just ask that you would forgive us in that. You forgive us for, for not letting perseverance finish in its work. And Lord, we're sorry for missing out on really what you had for us in that trial. We, we lost the meaning of it, and we lost the benefit of it. And Lord, forgive us. And Lord, I just ask that you would lay on our hearts something that you do want us to start today, persevering in. That, that thing that's most needed for us. Show us what it is. And Lord, give us the wisdom to persevere in it. Give us the wisdom to do it well. Give us the wisdom so that we can run our race well, so we can win the prize and have the crown of life and move into the potential that you have for us. Bless us in that way. And bless everyone here, Lord. Bless everyone. Be with them. Work in their life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.